thy peace, O God of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They come past me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over them, and let Satan stand at their right hand. When they shall be judged, let them be condemned, and let their prayers become sins. Let their days be few, and let them never take their office. Let their children be fatherless, and their wives a widow. Let their children be contented, vagabonds, and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of the desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that they have, and let the strangers spoil their labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto them. Neither let there be any to favor their fatherless children. Let their posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of their fathers be remembered with God, and let not the sin of their mothers be forgiven. Let them be before God continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the face of the earth, because that they remember not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that they might even slay the broken in heart. As they love cursing, so let it come unto them. As they delight not in blessing, so let it be far from them. As they clothe themselves with cursing as a their garment, so let it come into their mouth like water, like oil into their bones. Let it be unto them as the garment which covereth them, and for a girl with their garden continually. Let this be the reward of my adversaries from the Lord, from the one true God, from the Most High Elohim, and of them that speak evil against my soul. But do thou for me, O God. themselves with their own confusion as with a mantle. I will greatly praise the Most High with my mouth. Yea, I will praise him among the multitude, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those that condemn his soul. Let Satan stand at their right hand now and forever. Amen. Totón al Yomotlati. Totón al Yeis Polio. Iwan Sentla Yowaya no Teshkate. Matig Matig Ha Oxepa Guala Soxepa Kisaki. Iwan Yankui Kotikan Teshkla Wiliki. Mas no Katoyolnepan Tlatik Tlatikan. whisper in our ears, but a single word can give you courage or turn your favorite pleasure into your worst nightmare. Those with the demon's touch, like those part angel, living alongside us. Charging at 200. Clear! Go, go! Go again! Charging at 300. Clear! We got her! She's back!
And I remember seeing these demons and I kept saying, where, where am I? Let me go. They wouldn't say nothing to me, but they look at me and they laugh. They were kicking. That's all they would do. And you could see them. They have real long, long fingernails. Real powerful, sharp nails. Like really. But they wouldn't respond to me. They were just giggling at me, laughing at me. And as I'm moving forward, I start seeing this big, big black tunnel. This tunnel was huge. And I can hear the sound of this tunnel. And I'm starting to enter this tunnel. As I'm beginning to go into the tunnel, halfway into this tunnel, this terrible smell starts to come out of this tunnel. A smell that I wanted to die. Um, this smell was, was just horrible, horrible. If this smell was on the earth, we would die because that's a terrible smell. There's no air in there. There's nothing. So I had to pass this smell. And I see a tiny little light at the end of this tunnel. And I said to myself, oh, okay, well, as soon as I get to that end of that tunnel, that little light, I'm going to be safe. But I wanted to die. It felt ugly. Yeah. And the, and the Word of God says this is the second death. It's just the beginning of your second death. As I'm going into this tunnel, I finally went to the end of the tunnel. I didn't see that little light no more. Everything was just... I didn't see the demons no more. So I'm just standing there, okay? And then some of these flames just rose from the ground up. Real hard. That's the sound that I heard. You know how we open our curtains in the morning? So that's the way the flames split. When the flames split, a voice told me, walk forward, going. So I walked forward. When I went forward, <clears throat> there was a lot of screams. There was a lot of fire. I seen a lot of people. There was a lot of people screaming. Before I go forward, I'm not saying this to scare you guys. I'm not here to scare anybody. I'm just telling you. The truth what happens after death. I seen all this. I seen rivers of fire. People are burning. There's been people burning there for many, many, many years, hundreds of years. People are, uh, their flesh burns. They burn, they burn, they burn, and the flesh falls. And your bones get nice and toasty and black and gray. And when it's done, then the flame, but your skin, your flesh starts growing back on you. And then the flames start again. And I also see maggots crawling through your flesh, through you, in your bones. And they're eating you. They're eating your flesh. It makes no difference. Just picture yourself now in the earth. If you have bugs or, fr or maggots eating your flesh, how would that feel? But you're in hell already. There's nothing you can do. You have to. That's the torture. That's, that's, the, that's your everlasting torture life in there. I seen teenagers for the disobedience of their parents. I seen pastors because it said in the word, for they have robbed me of my tithing. I seen Christians because they didn't want to get up and do anything to God. And then Christians doing things at home, thinking that nobody will see them. I keep repenting, repenting, but they just never got out of doing what they kept doing and playing, playing, playing with God. They were either warm or either cold, but they're lukewarm. They just kept playing and playing and playing. 
but the flames there rise higher on Christians. Demons torture you in different ways, even sexually. <laughs> they can tear your head, they can sexually <laughs> attack you, they can cut you, they can stab you. They will tear your pieces and you're still alive. You can feel everything that's going on. I seen witches, I seen warlocks because Satan told them that he was going to promise them their kingdom if they serve him, which it was a lie. All he wanted was your soul. One soul is a million souls to the Lord. That's how valuable your soul is. As I'm walking through these dirt road, there's fire and there's screaming, there's shouting and people saying that, let me out. Let me out. I, I want to do right. I want to do right this time. I promise to do right. Let me go out and tell the world and let them know that this is a real place. Hell is real. But it's too late. Noticed this, this being, this creature looking at me. It was in, in a cube at first, and the person who was looking at this particular, into this creature, it was one of those tall creatures with the round, with the faces that went, went around. But it was of a beautiful purplish color, in a way, kind of a beautiful creature, but hideous at the same time. And with its faces revolving around, very seductive, very, very flattering, very, very persuasive. It would try to plant thoughts in your mind, trying to tell you. Why would such a good God allow people to suffer like this? I was trying to get me to curse God. I really don't know who the demon creature was. I know he had great power and authority. He either was a second in command or he could have been Satan himself. Can you see the gates of hell? The angel raised his hand, and as he brought it down, the gates ripped open with a great noise. Daniel could hear the crying and wailing of many people, but he could not see any of them. shone from the angel's body into the darkness so that Daniel could see more clearly. There were many people there, but unlike the souls in heaven, the appearance of these people was as it had been on earth. They were from every race, culture, and nationality. Every person seemed trapped in their own personal torment, a torment which would go on for eternity, and they could not communicate with others. The sounds of crying and wailing were almost deafening. Suddenly, they all seemed to become aware of Daniel and started crying to him for help. And they called to Daniel only as if they could not see the angel. Immediately, 
immediately after the pastor made the statement, the force that was tormenting him seemed to increase. The people had flesh, but no blood, and they almost seemed to be on fire, although no flames could be seen. There was a group of people that were eating their own flesh. They would vomit what they ate and their flesh grew back. This carried on in an endless cycle of torment. Those people you see eating themselves, they practiced witchcraft while they were on earth. They specialized in eating human flesh and now they'll eat themselves forever. They are reaping what they sowed. All these creatures, and I was thinking, who could fight off just one of these? I mean, nobody, you know, could fight them off. I mean, look at the size of that thing. And uh, such an evilness and a hatred for man. They hated me with a, uh, it's just an incredible hatred and blaspheming God. You're turned over to these demons, and they that hate you will rule over you. And you can't do anything about it. You know, and God's made us, man, the highest form of creation. Right? Man. And we work hard and we, uh, you know, get educated and all that. And now in hell, you're subjected to these creatures that have become the lowest form of creation. And they rule over you. I mean, how disgusting is that? I mean, this thing that has a, like a zero IQ and hates you, uh, just knows torment and can torment you for eternity. You know, that, is that thought bad enough? I mean, look... How, how bad could it be? I mean, you can't breathe, you can't eat, you can't sleep, you, you burn, you, you're tormented, and all this you have to endure for eternity. Anyway, so as I began ascending up this tunnel, um, it was going into pitch black now because I was leaving the flames and it lit up just a little bit to see those pits of fire. And like I said, the light didn't travel very far, but enough for me to see a little. And as we went up into this dark tunnel, it got really pitch black. And I was just so afraid and knowing that I was there forever and then all of a sudden I mean just all of a sudden no warning this bright light showed up and it was Jesus and uh, he showed up and just I just fell at his feet I didn't see his face I just saw a bright light and an outline of a man and as I was looking first I had first I looked and I, when I saw those demons and how powerful they were and then I realized you know, being with Jesus when we were going up that tunnel, that they look so, when I look back at those demons, they look like ants on the wall. When I was in his presence, they look like an ant on the wall. And I can't explain that. I don't know if they really became that small or they just appeared that day being with Jesus. But they looked like nothing. And I thought, Lord, look at those, those things that were so big that I was so afraid of. They're nothing. And he said, all you have to do is cast them out in my name. So anyway, when we were... Um, Back, he let me look back into that tunnel and I could see people falling one after another after another back down that tunnel I just came out of. And I just looked and I thought, oh Lord, all these people going down where I just came out of. This one vortex was spinning and a lady that just died in a car wreck came through and she was deposited right there. And I saw her as she arrived and inside her cube she saw it as the illusion of her grandmother's farm that her grandparents farm that she loved so well as when she was growing up and her grandmother recently passed away too so she got in this this cube and immediately she thought she was in heaven because there was a grandmother waiting there welcoming her. the grandmother that was actually a demon that gave the illusion of being the grandmother said dear pudding she made it to heaven I'm so glad you're here and she really thought that she was in paradise but there was a darker side to her she would make her children be what she want her children wanted something else she wanted them to be this and if they didn't do it her way it was the fist it was verbal abuse it was cutting down so, as she sat down, I was watching it, and the trees, limbs just grabbed her. 
And then she realized she was not in paradise. And as we passed some cubes, there were people inside and they were trapped in flames. And it was like their skin was still intact, but they were burning. And there was this individual and he was playing pool. And this guy was a child serial killer, but he lived in the 1940s. And he, but he was in this pool hall playing this pool before the punishments would commence again. He thought he had a break. And then these people in there would torment him and come and run and just grab him and tear him up. And out of the sky, I could see this um, big, big demon coming down. It reminds me of a snake. He just gobbled him and swallowed him. Then all these other little demons came up and said, you know, that's no fair. We didn't have our chance with him yet. Regurgitated him back up. He was whole. I know this sounds really bizarre, but that's what happened. Then all the other little demons, little teeny things, about a foot, three foot tall, just jumped on him. And he was powerless. And they were beating him and clawing him. And there was no rest for this guy whatsoever after that. It was constant torment. Everything that he ever done was, was being justly put back to him. Came to a cube and I was looking at this cube and this was a woman. She was dressed in fine garb. She was a temple prostitute, basically what it was. And she was somebody who died in Corneth around 69 AD. For a price, she would have a, a, a newborn son. For some reason, their religion was some strange thing. When you have a newborn son, you can offer it to, into a statue, and there's flames underneath the statue. You put the baby on the statue, and the, basically the baby would be cooked. And here she is in this temple. There was no let up to her torment. It was almost like all the little babies that she burned that were hers and other people's were tormenting her mocking her, pouncing on her, just crawling and tearing her up. And she just screamed and I had to turn away and walk. There was a, an individual that, um, she practiced the black dark craft. She was a witch. I just knew that she was a witch, but she died many, many, many hundreds of years ago. But she was trapped in a coffin, scratching, trying to get out. She couldn't get out. She was in, in that position for years and years and years and years, hundreds of years. And then finally, when she got it open, all the demons would pounce on her. And we walked on to another cube. We looked in this other cube on, the, on this row, and there was another lady. And she believed that Mother Earth could save her. And then if she honored the trees and the rocks, and she was into this nature thing, and part of their religious practice that she would practice would be getting out in the fields and dancing around a fire with a bunch of other people doing the same. The people that she thought that she was with were actually demons and they would come up to her and say, you did this, they pick up a stone, you say, the stone will save you here, and they smacked her with it. So she was standing there and the demons reached down there and, and reached in her mouth, ripped out her tongue, and part of her thing says, you talk bad? Oh, the stones are not going to save you. Nobody can save you. Then they ripped off her, just actually took her skin and just peeled it off. It was really slow and agonizing to shreds until nothing to the skeletons. Then they took the bones and broke the bones. And she felt everything. Then her body would come back together. The flesh would come back together. And she'd be whole again. And it would start all over again. A different scene would happen. And some of the cruelest people on earth were in these. Um, you know, some people, I don't like to say names of people or anything like that, but I will, will you know, this one particular individual is definitely there and everybody knows who, who, who it is, it's Adolf Hitler. Hitler was sitting in a cube, it was open, and it was just burning flames. He's just sitting there burning. And his flesh wasn't burning, and he had this hideous look on his face. And he was, as he was burning, the flesh would be rotting, and he was feeling every bit of it. It was almost like every oven of the gas, uh, of the concentration camps, all the tortures that went on there were being meted back to him in one intense flaming bit of stoked up white hot heat that would rot his flesh away at the same time, make him ashes, come back. He was just being tormented like that. He was just, I remember having this weird look on his eyes. It was just angry, vicious anger. As they pulled out of the parking lot, 
of that hospital, a young paramedic looked down into my face and I could barely see him. I was so weak. But he said, Sir, you need Jesus Christ. And I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know what he was talking about. So my reaction to that was to begin cursing. And uh, again, he stated to me, you need Jesus. And as he was talking to me, it, it appeared like the ambulance literally exploded in flames. I, I thought it had actually blown up. It filled with smoke. And immediately I was moving through that smoke as if through a tunnel. And after some period of time coming out of the smoke and out of the darkness, I began to hear the voices of a multitude of people screaming and groaning and crying. But as I looked down, the sensation was looking down upon a, a, a volcanic opening and seeing fire and smoke and, and people inside of this burning place screaming and crying. They were burning, but they weren't burning up. They weren't being consumed. And then the sensation of moving downward into this. But, but the most terrible part of it, I began to recognize many of the people that I was seeing in these flames as if a close-up lens on a camera was bringing their faces close to me, I could, I could see their features and see the agony and the pain and the frustration. And a number of them began to call my name and said, Ronnie, don't come to this place. There's no way out. There's no escape. If you come here, there's no way out. And I looked into the faces of, of one that had died in a robbery attempt who had been shot to death and bled to death on the sidewalk. And I looked in the face of two others that had died drunk in an automobile accident. And I looked into the face of others that had died of drug overdoses that we had partied together and, and the agony and the pain. But I believe the most painful part of it was the loneliness. And the depression was so heavy that there was no hope, there was no escape, there was no way out of this place. And the smell was like a sulfur, like an electric welder. And the, the stench was, was terrible. And as I looked at this, I had seen people killed. I had been involved in fights where people were killed. i had done time in prison for manslaughter myself. I grew up basically in a reform school and in a jail cell. I was beat on mercifully as a child by a father that had temper problems and alcohol problems. I was a runaway at 12 years old and I felt like there was nothing in this world that could frighten me. My life was wrecked, my marriage was wrecked, my health was wrecked, but now I'm seeing something that literally scares me to death because I don't understand it. And as I'm looking into this, this pit, this place of fire and screams and, and torment, I just fade out into blackness. And when I open my eyes, I'm in a hospital room in Knoxville, Tennessee. As I'm looking around the room, I see that there's Underneath the sheet on the bed, there's something under the sheet, a body. And so I bent over the bed, the head was turned away from me, and I looked at the face, and it looked like me. But that wasn't possible because I was standing there, I'm alive, I'm great, you know. And so I tried to talk to my wife. Can't you hear me? And, Can't you hear me? You know, she couldn't hear me or That's see me. That's not me! But I thought What's going on that here? she just was ignoring me. So I got very angry at her for ignoring me, for not paying attention to me. And I'm screaming and yelling at her, what's going on here? Why, why is this body in the bed that looks like me and how to get there and stuff like that? And I've got a hospital gown on and it's like really, everything's really real. And I hear people calling me outside the room and they're saying to me in soft, gentle voices, Howard, you gotta come with us now, come quickly, come out here. So I go over to the doorway of the room 
and there's people out in the hallway and they're um, uh, the hallway's dank it's gray it's not it's not light or dark it's just gray and they're all in grayness and they're men and women and what they're wearing might possibly be hospital uniforms um, and I asked them if they were from the doctor to take me to the operation and I told them I said I'm really sick and I'm gonna have an operation and I'm gonna die if I don't get this operation and I was supposed to have the operation eight hours ago and I'm telling them all this stuff and they're going well, you know we know we know we understand you know you gotta come, come quickly Howard come Howard, Howard, come, Howard quickly. come out here Howard come quickly come with us Howard we've been waiting for you waiting I left the room, which was real, clear, bright, and went into the hallway, which was dank and hazy, and um, followed these people. We had a very long journey. There's no, there's no time, and whenever I make a reference to time, <laughs> it's just an illusion because there was no time in this place. But this journey, if I were to recreate it, I'd have to walk like from Nashville to Louisville or something to, to recreate the, the walk with these people. And as we walked, they stayed around me and kept moving me on, and it kept getting darker and darker. Um, they were becoming more and more openly hostile to me. First, they were sort of syrupy sweet to get me to go with them, and then when I was going along with them, it was like, hurry up, keep moving, you know, shut up, stop asking questions, you know, they started getting more um, ugly. And so we get into complete darkness. And I'm absolutely terrified these people are very hostile I don't know where I am I said I'm not going to go with you any further they said um, you're almost there and we started to fight I just I was trying to get away from them they were pushing and pulling at me and um, there are now a lot of them what originally had been like a handful now was since it was darkness no one May, hundreds or thousands, I don't, I mean, I have no idea. And they're playing with me. You know, clearly they could have just destroyed me if they wanted to. They didn't want to destroy me. What they wanted to do was they wanted to inflict pain on me because they derived, pleasure isn't the right word, but they derived, derived satisfaction out of the pain that I experienced. So, what they were doing in the beginning part was it's real hard for me to talk about and I don't and I'm not going to tell you much about it just a little bit because um, it gets I mean just gets too ugly uh, but the, initially they were like tearing and biting um, tearing with their fingernails scratching gouging ripping and then uh, biting trying to defend myself, trying to fight them off, trying to get away from them, but there's, it's like being um, in a beehive, there's just hundreds of them all over me. And I eventually was just laying on the ground there, all ripped up, um, pain everywhere, inside, outside, and even Harder to bear than the physical pain was the emotional pain of what had just happened to me. The utter degradation that I just experienced. You know, I never once felt that it was um, unjust or wrong. I heard my voice. It wasn't somebody else's voice. It wasn't the voice of God or anything. It was my voice. And I heard it speak, but I didn't speak it. So whether it's the voice of my conscience or I don't know what it was, it was just but I distinctly heard my voice say, Pray to God. And so I thought to myself, I don't believe in God. I pray to God. And I'm thinking. Even if I could pray, I don't know how to pray anymore. I haven't prayed. And at that time I probably hadn't prayed in 22, 23 years, so and so I'm thinking like when when, when I was a child and we said prayers in Sunday school and we said prayers in church and what did we say? And I'm trying to think of the, I'm trying to think of it because the, to me, to pray was to recite something that I'd learned. That's what it, that's what I thought a prayer was. Then, so I'm 
let's say, the Lord is my shepherd, um, give us this day our daily bread. My country, tis of thee. No, that's not a prayer, that's wrong. Um, let's see, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers. You know, I'm getting all mixed up. I can't remember how to pray. And then the people who are around me, if I, every time I'd like mention God, these people who had attacked me and beaten me, every time I mentioned God, it was as if mentioning God was throwing boiling water on them. They would shriek, they would scream, they would yell, and in worse profanity than, than anything I've ever heard in this world. The other thing that was happening was that they, they um, couldn't bear to be around me talking about God. It was so it was so painful for them to hear about God that they kept backing away, backing away, backing away. And so I had a sense that I could push them away by talking about God. And so I'm trying to remember prayers and I'm getting all confused and mixed up and it was just all um, crazy and I'm lying there and eventually I realized that they're gone and I'm alone. Now I was alone there for an eternity and what I mean by that was um, absolutely no sense of time to, but I thought about my life thought about what I'd done and what I hadn't done I thought about the situation that I was in and this the conclusion that I came to was is that I had lived an entirely my adult life I had lived a selfish life my only God in my adult life was myself I realized that I was um, you know, something terribly, terribly wrong with my life and that the people that attacked me were the same kind of people that I was. They were not me monsters, they weren't demons. They were people who had missed it. The, p the point of being born and being alive in this world. They'd missed it and they'd lived lives of selfishness and cruelty. And now we're in a world where there was nothing else. There was nothing but selfishness and cruelty, and they were doomed to inflict that upon each other and upon themselves, uh, probably forever and ever and ever and ever without end. Because if you keep doing this, you're not going to last long, and it's not going to be pretty, all right? And if you die tomorrow, you're going to be lucky, okay? So you better stop doing what you're doing and leave it alone. You don't understand that you're surrounded. You don't even know what you're talking about, all right? If you do this anymore, do you want the stomach geeks to start getting worse? Jim, do you want to have to go visit the doctor pretty soon and find out what he has to say? If you don't shut the fuck up. You don't scare us, you don't scare us, we're the children of the dawn. We were here long before you, we'll be here when you are gone. Your engines run on blood, our engines run on love.